cafe services uh, before you in many ways it's quite similar to uh, to what we normally do apart from the fact you can drink your tea and coffee while uh, we're worshipping um, there will be a little bit more interactive uh, elements to uh, our worship this morning as we worship in this way a couple of notices to uh, begin with this morning musicians a reminder our musicians are hoping to uh, stay behind after the service this morning for some lunch uh, and to learn some new songs. Uh, if anybody wants to come and join us, they're welcome to do so. We have uh, lots so. of food. We have lots of food, so <laughs> please feel free. Even if you're not aching, you'll ever be standing up the front of the church leading our worship. If you just want to hear some new songs that you might find yourself singing as a member of the congregation, uh, you're very welcome to join us uh, for that. Steph has something she wants to say. Sorry, it's going to be a bit by surprise then. I'm, I'm by ten, I'm in the room now. Um, good morning. Um, my name's Steph. For, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm also on the leadership team of Wesley Baptist and I'm the acting centre manager at the Armstrong Centre. So I, I find myself in a very privileged position. Um, uh, there's a couple of things that I just thought I just felt so compelled to share with you. Um, but first of all, just stay with me here, all right? <laughs> For those of you who know me well, I wander a little bit, but I'll stay, try and stay on message. Um, um, I'm married to David. He's over there. Lovely man. Um, <laughs> he, he, he's run a business for many years. Oh, he's run several businesses over many years. And so he reads a lot of business books. And one of the books that has had a quite profound impact on him recently, he quotes, he, does, he has a quote from it. And uh, one of the quotes, and it's not, a, it's not a correct quote, but basically the essence of it is, um, we are, and I agree with this quote to a certain extent, we are the sum of the five people we spend most time with. Basically, the five people in our lives that we spend most time with are, are hugely influential on us, on, on ha how we behave, uh, on our value systems, uh, and what we choose to do. They're highly influential. Now, he's looking at from a business point of view, so he goes and lots, look, look, reads and does a lot business-wise. But actually, I think that's, there's a lot of truth in that statement in terms of our general lives. We are social beings, generally, human beings. And uh, the five people we spend most time with are hugely influential. Now, on, a, on another level, we are part of a, a spiritual community, a faith community, a community that follows Jesus Christ. Um, so I kind of like took that quote a little bit further on and found that very challenging, <laughs> to be honest. Because I suddenly went, oh. <laughs> so if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and... I profess to other people that he is the key most individual in my life. How much time do I spend with him? Um, I, I had a bit of a... That was a challenge. So part of that challenge was um, David and I had a really uh, an amazing opportunity. I feel hugely privileged to have the time and the resources on so many levels to do stuff like this. David and I were in Belfast last week. Uh, we went to something called The Gathering, which was the international gathering of a movement called the 24-7 Prayer Movement. Has anybody heard of it? <coughs> If you dip into Lectio 365 app, which is the morning and evening prayer app, it's that organisation that has produced that app. They are there, they are a prayerful community and they are deeply immersed in some of the ways of being as a Christian that come from the roots of the desert fathers and the monastic tradition 
only how, and they try and appropriate that in our context today. So we went there. There are people who are very genuine, funny, but they are deep prayers. And so um, that challenge that I had a few weeks ago when I was thinking about the five most influential people in my life, <laughs> it was reinforced big time last weekend. And um, so one of the things that came out of this, now, now please don't get me wrong when I say this, I am not a deeply spiritual person. I am not, my, my halo, as those of you who work with me regularly, slips <laughs> quite profoundly on an almost second by second basis. So, so please don't misunderstand me, but I did feel this deep compulsion and challenge to spend some time in the presence of God. So, um, and I'm still not rejoicing over this, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Now, I have felt for a while that we need to really wrestle back the prayer room as a place where people can meet God. Now, I've been one of those people who've, who's used that as a very convenient place to work, and it is, because you can see people coming and going. But I'm deeply challenged that we actually need to get make sure that that space is a place where people can come and rest in the presence of God. Um, where the people of God pray, the presence of God tends to stay. I don't know how he does it, he just tends to inhabit, he inhabits spaces. And I know, I know, I know that we have prayed in that space since we've got the keys, since the first day we got the keys. And when people go into that, that space, it's not beautifully decorated, they feel something. They go, isn't this a lovely room? And I look around and go, all I see is the rubbish at the back. <laughs> I only see unpainted walls. People feel the presence of God there. So I just felt deeply challenged, one, to actually sit in the presence of God for an extended period of time, but also really put another marker as one of the, the overseers, the leaders in the church, a stand that that room is a sacred space. <coughs> so anyway, I felt God challenging me last weekend to go and pray in there for 24 hours. So from the, the first weekend in December, I think it's the 3rd and 4th. So from starting at 5 p.m., on Saturday, the 3rd of December, to 5pm on Sunday, the 5th, I'm going to be inhabiting that prayer room, apart from the old toilet break, obviously. Um, so, um, and my invitation to you, you have no, this is my, this is my journey, okay, this is the thing that God is, but I would like, as my church family, to invite you to just come and join me and sit in the presence of God for half an hour during that 24 hours. I ask nothing more. I invite nothing more of you. You don't have to come if you don't even feel God wants you to do that. Okay? But I would really appreciate company. No pressure. No emotional blackmail. Okay? But I will. Now, I'm not going to do anything in that time. There may be some music on in the background. There will be prayer aids. But I intend, and this will be another miracle for me, to mainly sit in silence in the presence of God. I don't know what he's going to do, I just feel compelled to do it because I think it's something he's asked me to do. There's nothing sexy about it, there's nothing noisy about it, there's nothing even very appealing on one level about it, just sitting down, I'm not very good at that, um, but I, will, I invite you to join me and just see what God does. And one of the other things that comes out of that, so excuse me for extending my time here, is that I also wanted to share one of the other reasons why I need, I need personally to sit in the presence of God, is that God is doing something in this place. And I don't always know what it is. It's not something I've recognised before. And if I don't get in tune, if I don't position myself in his presence where I hear his voice, I'm going to miss it. I'm getting too old to miss the voice of God, to be honest. I'm getting too tired, and if I don't embed myself in a place where I can hear him better, I'm going to miss some of the good things he's doing here, with some of the amazing people who come across my path and the paths of others here, and I can't, I personally can't do the job I'm doing here without doing something other, and the only other I know is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, one of the things I just want to encourage you. This hopefully is that in the in two Monday, not this coming Monday, the Monday after, we're starting our seniors' afternoon. 
over 65s. Now this has come out of the Jubilee tea that Emily instigated um, and uh, just talking to people. But one of the things that I've realised in this place is it's very easy. I come from a culture that creates things, that likes, I'm a person who likes to do. And this time round, I've deliberately said, I'm not doing much. I'm going to wait to see what God brings. And honestly, I thought, I'm, I, have a, I have a real heart for young people. Um, but, and I thought it was going to be bringing young people into the building, but it isn't. It's, God is wanting to, to do something with those people who are statistically that much nearer to meeting him. <laughs> we in our society, I'm serious here. Our society renders you obsolete when you get to a certain age, and I'm moving into that bracket. Okay, you don't get seen, you don't get acknowledged. Your the whole life, this life experience that has been lived, is not recognised, not valued and not honoured and our God is a God that get that makes him angry I think that really makes him angry that we do not honour those amongst us who have got an awful lot to give so I felt very strongly about that anyway I think other people do it is a real God thing because we started to just have little conversations here and here but Karen and I have had groups of people proactively saying, are you going to do anything for this age group in this building? We'd really like to get involved. NHS Wellbeing, the, arms, the company that runs the almshouses, the charity that runs the almshouses, and they've got lots of almshouses in Beverly, um, they have, have proactively come to us and asked, how can we partner with you? So we also now, um, our first meeting, we will have, we'll have one of our hirers, the line, a lady who does line dancing here, coming to do some light, some gentle line dancing. Do come and on. I'm going to get Phil up there, because I really want to, I want to see Phil do all the line dancing. But she's coming to do that for free. She's one of our hirers. We just asked her, and she went, yes, I'd love to. Um, Cherry Tree Centre, who I work really, we work really closely with, are going to come and do with some advice, give, have an advice table. And the thing that was really, really bothering me, which was quite, which Nigel got put in my head months and months ago, was that if we were going to do a seniors, we needed somebody who does a tech table, who can actually guide people on how to use their, ta their smartphones, their tablets, and things like that. I've been praying for someone who would be able to do that tech table on a regular basis, but who could also communicate clearly, because I'm married to a techie, believe me, they don't, what is, what is absolutely <laughs> no brainer for them is kind of a completely different language to me. I, I don't understand. So actually putting that kind of stuff in the right language for most of us to understand is really important. Anyway, this week we went to the U3A, another one of our um, hirers, this is the University of the Third Age, and said, would you like to come and contribute to a seniors afternoon? Yes. Um, uh, but we'll come and send somebody to come talk to you. So Karen had a word with this lady called Anne, and she said, um, Aunt Karen said, do you know anyone who could do a tech table with, um, you know, who actually could run that, sit and do an advice table? And she said, well, actually, funny you should say that. I used to give advice at Bridlington and somewhere else, uh, libraries, it was part of my job. I used to run a tech table there where you've just come and have advice. And um, Karen went, I don't, you don't know how much of an hour, I, I, you know, she said, I'll, I'll be happy to do that on a regular basis. I've been looking to see what else needs to be done. Karen went, you don't know what an answer to prayer that is. And she went, oh, mm -hmm. it, it's funny you should say that. Um, I haven't been going to church for a while. I felt a little bit disassociated with church. And I, and I felt recently, I've been praying recently, that God would show me an in back into something that he wants me to do. And honestly, we're having conversations like that all the time. Um, so, um, at people who've been on the fringes of church, who have been disenfranchised from church, who would never come into a church on a Sunday morning, um, are having God conversations with us. And um, um, we are part of that. 
we, we have allowed that. We have allowed that to happen. And I know, but I know, but I know um, that as we dip into um, a life of positioning ourselves in the presence of God, more and more and more and more and more of that will come clear and become obvious. And, and I do believe that whether they come and sit in this church gathering or whether it's a church gathering that they can more closely identify with in the midweek, people are coming to, 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 into the presence of Jesus, absolutely enthralled by the presence of Jesus, and will become um, transformed by the presence of Jesus. And it won't look like what, what, what we think it's going to look like. I know that as well. But so keep praying. Please, if you want to come and join in the seniors, whether you just want to come sit or you want to come and pray in the prayer room, or whether you want to come and just talk to people, come and join in the seniors. But also, um, between um, five and five that weekend, first weekend in December, please would you come and, and join me too, because <laughs> I'd love the company. Tracy? A couple of questions. Can people... Um People come for more than half an hour, should they? Of course. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm half an hour because half an hour is realistic for lots of people. It's realistic for me. It's stretching me, to be quite honest. So, um, yeah, if, if I'm hoping that you just feel compelled to stay for longer. <laughs> the other question is if people have neighbours and senior age 65 and over, how can they involve them in? Okay, well then, um, the detail, just um, either email or phone um, the centre, um, uh, or there are some leaflets on the back. Uh, well, come find me and I'll, and I'll give you a leaflet. They can fill it in, bring it back to Karen or I. Okay, thank you for your patience. Thanks, Steph. <coughs> we might pray for 24 hours, but <coughs> the angels around the throne of heaven are praying continually. John has a vision of them, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And we're going to join our voices with theirs. We're going to sing a couple of songs to pick up on that theme of God as the holy God who we worship together. Please stand as we praise God. <laughs>
begin to imagine the fullness of who you are. We cannot see you, we cannot understand or imagine the power that is at work through you. You truly are something beyond us, so much bigger, so much more amazing than we can comprehend. And yet, Lord, you are the God who meets with us in this place, in love. And we pray that as we gather this morning, we might see you, we might experience you, we might worship you as not a God who is distant, but our God, who draws near to us by the power of your Spirit. 
and so help us to see you today in all your glory but in all your love amen we're going to be continuing this morning uh, to look at the book of hebrews we're going to look at two short passages from that book which speak about the presence of god in the throne room of heaven which is picture language. We can't describe God in human words, but it's seeking to give something of the idea of the glory and majesty and wonder of God. But before we turn to Hebrews, we're going to look at another Bible story of a vision of God on his throne. A man named Isaiah, the prophet, lived 700 years or so before Jesus. And we're going to watch a short cartoon clip which shows Isaiah, now an old man, in the company of two children from our age and a robot. But, you know... Move beyond that, in that, that sense. It's, it's an American TV series that has people from our age going back in time uh, to the Bible stories. So it shows Isaiah as an old man, remembering back to a vision of God that he had many years before. So let's watch this together. Isaiah sees God on his throne, glorious, shining in light which human eyes cannot fully see. Surrounded by angels, singing of God's holiness, his perfection, his glory. How wonderful and pure he is. Let's think for a moment. If you were to see that, if that happened here and now, the vision a bit like that. Just talk around your tables for literally one minute. A couple of words. How would you feel? How do you think you'd feel if that happened here and now? <laughs> Survivor's complex. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> we're going with that. Scared. 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 Yeah. Lydia. Surprise. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Any other thoughts? Alex. Fair enough. Any others? Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Yeah. Scared. Overwhelmed. Surprised. Yes. Isaiah certainly wasn't expecting that. I doubt any of us will ever see a vision quite like that. Isaiah did. John did in the book of Revelation. He describes a similar vision, but it, it, it's quite rare. Isaiah's response, and I expect ours would be the same, would, is to realise quite how small and insignificant and unworthy, yeah, and scared and overwhelmed. Faced with the perfection of God... He becomes very aware how he's not perfect. He's unclean, as he describes it. He says, my lips are unclean, the people around me are unclean. And yet, I'm seeing the full purity of God. This is terrifying. We can experience sometimes things that feel like the presence of God. In a special, particular place, particular time. Sometimes perhaps we might wonder if it's real. I think any true experience and encounter with God has an element of making us aware quite how small and insignificant we are in comparison to the greatness of God. But God doesn't leave us there. He didn't leave Isaiah there in that place of ruin, that place of fear. Isaiah says, my lips are unclean. And so we saw it on the video. One of the angels flies to the altar the tongs, pulls out a red hot coal and touches it to Isaiah's lips and says, your lips are now clean. 
Sounds a bit odd, really. I don't know if you've ever been around coal or seen coal miners coming out of the mines. I don't think clean is the word that would bring to mind. It's dusty, it's dirty. But actually, coal can be used to cleanse and purify. Does anybody have one of those bitter water filters? One of the things you've got in there is charcoal. Because it can filter the water. And we're actually going to do that. If the children want to come up to the front, we're going to prove how coal can make things clean. You want to come and help me with this, some of the younger people? We're going to do a little experiment. Okay? Because that's not very clean. That's actually water. Not Coca-Cola, it's water. With mud and dirt and dust in it. I got the water from the tap and I got the dust from the garden. And I mixed them together. And so... We have. Fantastic. Um, James, can you hold that bag up? Can you hold no, that, that one? Hold it up to people so you can see it. In there, we've got black powder. That's charcoal powder. So it's burnt coal. So we're going to pour that very carefully into here. Okay, so that puts the charcoal in there. Right then, we all have a little bit of a go with this. Okay, so there we go. Right, if you want to go first down again, you just want to pour a tiny little bit of water into the top of there, very carefully. Not too much at once. There we are. If you want to pour a bit in, James, you can all pour a bit in. Go around and pour a little bit at a the time. There we are, Alex. So it starts a bit through while we're pouring, but that's fine, we'll keep pouring. Not too much. Here we are. Let's settle through a bit, a little bit. And we're going to add spinach and then we'll have it, have it everywhere. We don't want there we are. You pour a little bit in for me. There we are. Right. Here we go. drip through, and we'll be able to have a look in a little bit later and see how, how it comes through. It's not going to do it on the first time. What we might do is when we break for refreshments in a minute, we might take that water and pour it through again, because we've got some more charcoal powder, and see where we get to. But compare, you can see already, can't you? Can you see the difference between the two? That looks like slightly murky, but clear water. That looks like Coca-Cola, <laughs> because it's that, that dirty. There is a slightly different block, isn't it? Quite block, isn't it? Um, so we'll let that filter through, and then as I say, when we break for refreshments in a couple of minutes, if people want to come and help me pour it through again, and we'll see whether we can get really clean water coming out the second time through. We're going to go sit down. But that is one of the symbols for what, I, what happened with Isaiah. The charcoal cleans him, cleans his lips. And the other fact that it makes it clean is because it's hot. Do you know, if you go into hospital and they have to do an operation, do you know how they clean the instruments that they use to operate on you, to make sure you don't get germs? Have you got an idea? Alex? Not hot metal. Not hot metal, no. James? Are you kidding? Yeah. It's actually a slightly trick question. These days they use lasers and ultraviolet. But until very, very recently, and still in some parts around the world, hot steam. That was how they did. And do you know who invented the idea of sterilising things with hot steam? This is a slight diversion. Louis Pasteur. Sorry? Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Ah, it wasn't Louis Pasteur, but yeah, it, you're, you're right. He discovered it, but actually the Romans knew about it. The Romans used to do it, and it's one of those things that got lost and then refound. And the Romans used to use that. But the heat, the heat kills the germs. 
and the charcoal kills the germs. And so God can say to Isaiah, you are now clean. It's a vision, it's picture language. But it's a picture of a reality that we'll look at in a bit more detail as we're going on. But as we come into God's presence and we're aware, we're, we're scared, we're aware how much bigger he is than we are, we're aware how unworthy we are, God can still say to us, you are clean, you are welcome here. But we do need to recognise that we are unworthy, we do need to recognise that need for forgiveness, that need for cleansing. And so we're going to pray now, we're going to use a song. Be still for the presence of the Lord. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a verse of the song, and then I'll pray, then another verse, and I'll pray, and another verse, and I'll pray. So we're going to intersperse the verses of the songs with some spoken prayers. So we'll stay seated, and we'll sing verse 1, and then I'll pray, and then verse 2. So be still for the presence of the Lord. any hint of the uncleanness of sin. We acknowledge your holy presence with us now and we offer you our praise and adoration and the worship of our hearts. over the whole of creation. We confess your indescribable greatness. And as we offer you our songs and prayers, our words and the worship of our hearts, we seek to bring glory to your name.
your purity and holiness, we confess our impurity and sinfulness. Like your servant Isaiah, we are a people of unclean lips. And not just our lips, but our hands and feet, our eyes and ears, our hearts and minds. We confess that so often we act in ways that do not bring glory to you. We do not acknowledge you in every part of our lives. Instead of following your holiness, we bring dishonour to your name. So in a moment of silence, we say sorry for those times during this week when we've hurt you and others by our thoughts, our words and our actions. We thank you, Lord, that your power is at work in this place to cleanse and heal. Touch our whole lives with the cleansing of your spirit, so that we might stand again in your presence and go into all the world to live lives which show you throughout the whole earth. May we hear again the words of the Lord, your guilt is taken away and your sin blotted out. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to take a short break. Just to stretch your legs, get another cup of coffee if you want, and then we'll come back and just look briefly at a passage from Hebrews, which tells us how Jesus can provide an even greater cleansing than that was available to Isaiah. Just a couple of moments to have a break. If anybody wants to come and help me filter this water a bit more, please do. Okay! While we are regathering, does anybody have anything to celebrate this week? Anybody want chocolate, basically? Joel, what do you want chocolate for? I shouldn't go last week, but I have had my driving theory. Joel's passed his driving theory test. Be careful on the roads around Aaron. <laughs> Tracy's got her marriage certificate, that's a bit of a saga. The wedding was July, so uh, she can now prove she's married to Graham, which is fantastic. Anybody else got anything to celebrate? <coughs> well, whichever way you want to do it, as long as you only claim it once, Joe. <laughs> is it your birthday? Well, happy birthday to Joe for this week. It's fantastic. 21 again. And Alison has a notice for us for something that's coming up to uh, to share um, as what we're doing. So thank you, Alison. Yes. So um, if you've read first, and I'm sure everybody has. Um, then on Saturday the 19th, that's two weeks yesterday, we have our Tear Fund Quiz, which we've done a few times before. We've done it in person um, and we've done it online. We can do it in person here and it will be good. It will be fun. It's open for everybody. It's free and it will be from seven o'clock. Now at seven o'clock, hopefully we will have cake and drinks. Um, but if there's going to be cakes, we need people to volunteer to make cakes, bring cakes. Um, so there will be sign-up sheets at the back, and also if you're doing a bit of help with serving drinks and setting up the room and putting the room back together again at the end. 
but mainly it's to say put a date in your diary, invite your friends, family, anybody who knows any information which might be useful in the quiz. So think about your team, if you want to have a team, make sure you've got a good selection of people who know lots of things about lots of different things. Don't ask me about sport. Um, and as I say, it's free donations to Tier Fund, and they aim each year to make it the biggest quiz, I think, in the world. Um, whether they manage that every year, I don't know. But yeah, please sign up. Um, Please sign up for if you make cake, etc. You don't need to sign up to say you're coming, but we hope you will. Fantastic, thank you, Alison. The promise is to be uh, a good night. We've got a bit more filtering on our water. <coughs> Alison was actually telling me when she was in Africa they used to do that with the water in the well, filter it through charcoal. And if we took that and we boiled it, adding the heat back in, then we could drink that. Um, and that would be perfectly safe and healthy for you because of the filtering of the charcoal. We're going to read um, from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a complicated book, so I've tried to find the easiest language I can uh, for these passages, so hopefully our young people can understand them too. So these are a few verses from Hebrews 4 and then a few verses from Hebrews 10. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God. Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then, and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will receive mercy, and find grace to help us just when we need it. And then from Hebrews 10. We have then, my friends, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. He has opened for us a new way, a living way through the curtain, that is, through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience, with bodies washed with clean water, let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess, because we can trust God to keep his promise. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another, to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see that the day of the Lord is coming nearer. We're going to think about those passages for about 10 minutes or so. And I've got some worksheets for the young people. So if any young people want to come up here and collect a pack of worksheets and some pens. The worksheets are not an excuse not to listen. <laughs> but they will tie in. What you've got is you've got one colouring sheet. Make sure you get yourself some pens there. There's one colouring sheet. There's one little sort of um, code quiz. And then there's one sheet there to help us to think what we might pray about. And we might need that a little bit later in the service. You might want to just think a little bit carefully about that one. You might need that to pray there towards the end of the service. Anybody else need those? I'll leave the rest on the table there if anybody needs to come up and get them. So we had two readings from the Bible. They both speak of coming into God's presence. But not now with fear and trembling like Isaiah, but the word that they both use was confidence. So how can we come before God with confidence? Well, the answer, you will not be surprised to hear, is Jesus. The answer is always Jesus, isn't it? <laughs> but let's, let's expand that a little bit. Three things briefly. 
Firstly, Hebrews 4 tells us that we have Jesus as our high priest who is sympathetic to our weakness. <laughs> Jesus is the high priest, if you remember, we talked about this a couple of times over the last couple of weeks, was the one who provided the link between God and his people. The one who went on behalf of the people to worship God and brought the word of God to the people. And Jesus, as our high priest, the Son of God, is in heaven, sat next to God on his throne. But he's the same Jesus who walked this earth as a Middle Eastern man 2,000 years ago. Fully human. He's lived our human existence He's experienced temptation. He knows our human weakness. He knows our tendency to do wrong. And yes, Jesus resisted temptation. He did not sin. But he's been there. He looks with compassion upon us because he knows what it's like to be human. He's not going to drive us away because we're weak and we're tempted He's sympathetic to our experience, to who we are. <coughs> and because of that, the second thing we see is that God's throne is described as a throne of grace. We're approaching God on a throne not of power and majesty and terror, though God is powerful and majestic. But as we see Jesus at that throne, interceding for us, the, the, the Bible says, Standing there next to God, representing us to God, the throne of God becomes a place of grace and mercy. Sinful human beings, us, each one of us, cannot face the presence of God without being destroyed. But Jesus, who is human, as well as being God, stands permanently in God's presence. He died taking upon himself everything that was due to us because of our sin. Offering himself as the perfect sacrifice, Nigel reminded us about last week. So that as we come to God through Jesus, we do not experience anger and destruction, but grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so we can approach with confidence. Not because of who we are, but because we see Jesus is there. We see the one who represents us, the one who died for us, there. And so we can come in confidence because of who he is. Because he's opened up a way for us into the mercy of the presence of God. Which links to the third way in which Jesus is described as being the answer. As we come forward to Hebrews 10, it talks about a way being made through the curtain. Only the high priests could go behind the thick curtain that separated off the most holy place in the temple. Only the high priest could enter into the presence of God. And he went in once a year. He did what he had to do as his priestly duty. And then he returned. And the curtain fell back behind him and that barrier was restored. No one could enter. No one could even see the cloud in which God dwelt in that place so thick was that curtain. But as Jesus dies, there's an earthquake, and that physical curtain tears in two, and that's, that's a symbol of the much more important reality, that the barrier has been broken. This high priest, Jesus, goes through the curtain into God's presence, but rather than that curtain fall back behind him, it remains open, so that we can follow him in. There's a little detail earlier in Hebrews 10, which I, I must admit passed me by, but I read it in one of the commentaries. It says, day after day, each priest stands and performs his religious duties. But when Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The priests never sat down in the temple, because they were always busy. There was always something to be doing. They were constantly active. They went in, they did everything they had to do, and they came out again. Jesus offers one sacrifice, his own body, and then his work is done so he can sit down. It's finished. And he never leaves God's presence again. And so we can follow him into that presence with confidence because of his death 
for us. And because of his resurrection to new life and his ascension into the presence of God where he remains forever. We can follow him. And since we can, our preachers of the Hebrews continues, let us, let us draw near to God with confidence. Let us do it. What does it mean to draw near to God? Well, it can mean many things, but it certainly includes to pray. We can pray. You can pray. You can come and talk to God in the confidence that he welcomes you in Jesus and he listens to you. You don't need somebody else to pray for you. You don't need to go through a particular ritual to pray. You can pray to the God who welcomes you to his throne of grace. It includes also to meet together for worship, which he goes on to encourage his listeners to keep doing. And I'd encourage us to keep doing. What a privilege it is that we can come into God's presence and worship him. We can gather around his throne with all the angels who are praising him forever. Holy, holy, holy Lord. We can join our voices and our hearts to what they are doing, to their worship. Take every opportunity to worship God together. And to encourage one another as we do so. To encourage one another in our worship. There's much more we could say about what it means to come into the presence of God. But I think those two are key. Prayer and worship. Steph's already spoken of her personal challenge on spending time in God's presence. But I think actually we can each be challenged. He welcomes us in. He wants us to be there. We can have confidence as we come into his presence. So let's take that opportunity to spend time with our God. And so as we come towards the end of our service, we're going to do those two things, prayer and worship. We're going to pray first. And sometimes as we pray, one person will speak. It might be me or somebody else in the front. Sometimes here we open it up to the congregation for a time of, of open prayer. But I want us to try and grasp hold of the fact today that each and every one of us can pray. We don't need somebody else to pray for us. You don't need to be a particular person. You don't need to be a priest or a minister or an experienced Christian or highly educated. Whether you pray often or whether you hardly ever pray, we can come into God's presence with confidence as we pray in the name of Jesus. Some of you may feel, well, I'm not quite sure I know how to pray or what to pray for. I'm going to pass these around in a moment. A couple for each table. They include a few example prayers if you really can't think what to say. They also include a copy of the sheet that the kids have got, which actually just gives you some headings. Talking to God, I love you because, please forgive me for, thank you for, some pointers of the sorts of things we might pray for. I came across a quote this week as well, which might be helpful for some of us. This is from Brother Lawrence, Carmelite monk. He said, for many years I was bothered by the thought that I was a failure at prayer. Then one day I realised I'd always be a failure at prayer, and I've got along much better ever since. <laughs> because if we set in our minds, I have to be able to pray like this for God to accept my prayers, we'll never get there. He just wants us to come in confidence and speak to him as the God who loves us. And so I'm going to hand one of these packs around to each table as I say, and we're simply then just going to spend a couple of minutes in quiet so that each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, can pray. Children, if you've been filling in the prayer sheets, you might now might be the opportunity to use it. Some of the things that you've written in need to pray about. I think, I'll pray about that now. And just in whatever way, for the next couple of minutes, in quiet, each of us to come into God's presence and to pray.
Right. Thank you for the huge privilege of being able to speak to you, to talk to you. Thank you that you've made this possible through Jesus and his sacrifice. We know we cannot stand before you because of who we are. But we thank you that you welcome us in Jesus. Help us each and every day of our lives to spend time with you, knowing that you hear us, you listen to our prayers, and that you love to spend time with us. Give us confidence, Lord, in you. Confidence when we feel, I haven't prayed for ages, what's God going to say? What's God going to think? Confidence that you still love us, you still welcome us. Confidence when we feel like we don't know what to say and we're just stuttering. That you still hear each and every word and you love to hear us speaking to you. Help time and pray in your presence to become part of who we are, that we might be changed by that experience through the power of your Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so we'll pray together and we're going to conclude by worshipping together. We're going to sing a song that reinforces what we've been thinking of. Boldly, I approach the throne. Let's sing Art of Celebration. Thank you.
him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious throne without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.